Welcome to Hand in Pocket, the podcast that explores pickpocketing history, techniques, lingo, and its place in popular culture. I'm your host, Les S. Moore. This is your audio tour of the Virtual Museum of History's most famous pickpockets. Our first exhibit is of the notorious Cutting Ball. Little is known about this Elizabethan pickpocket, or cut purse as they were known at the time, as pockets were not common until around the 17th century. Ball was a 16th century pamphleteer, poet, dramatist, and author. Thomas Nash mentions a ballad written about Ball, but no copies of it exist today. Ball's sister Emma was a prostitute, quote, a sorry, ragged queen, end quote, who, according to various reports, was the mistress of Richard Tarleton, an English actor and the most famous clown of his time, known for impromptu comic verse, which came to be known as Tarleton's. He was partially responsible for developing Elizabethan theater into mass entertainment, paving the way for popular success of artists like William Shakespeare. Later, Emma was also mistress to popular Elizabethan author Robert Greene, Green often wrote about London's criminal world, having intimate knowledge of it. Author James A. Oliver wrote in his 2010 book, The Pamphleteers, The Birth of Journalism, Emergence of the Press, and the Fourth Estate, that, quote, Robert Green was always on the lookout for the ways of tricksters and villains, and his own creditors. He employed at least one cut purse by the sinister professional name of Cutting Ball, who was as quick with a dagger as his master's wit. In a tavern on one occasion, so it was said, an unwary writ server was made by Cutting Ball to eat his parchment with wax seal to taste. End quote. Ball met his end at Tyburn, where he was hanged. Now we come to Mary Firth, also known as Mall Cutpurse. We are not entirely clear on the facts of Mary Firth's life, as they are intermingled with myth and hyperbole. What we believe is that Mary was the child of a shoemaker and a housewife, and was born on Aldersgate Street near St. Paul's Cathedral in 1584. Mary was a wild child from an early age. The earliest record of her running into trouble with the law was when she was indicted in Middlesex for stealing two shillings eleven pence. She was sixteen years old. As she grew, Mary began to drink in taverns, carry a sword, sometimes dress as a man, and smoke a long clay pipe. It is claimed that she was the first woman in England to smoke. She would also steal purses from passers-by, by cutting the strings securing the purse to the owner's belts. For this, she earned the name Mall Cut Purse. According to Volume 1 of the Complete Newgate Calendar, Mall became a criminal because, quote, her income being not equivalent to her expenses, she entered herself into the society of divers, otherwise called file cliers, cut purses, or pickpockets, which people are a kind of land pirates trading altogether in other men's bottoms for no other merchandise than bullion and ready coin, and they keep most of the great fairs and marts in the world. In this unlawful way, she got a vast deal of money." End quote. Victims of pickpockets would come to Mall and offer her compensation for her retrieving their stolen goods. The dippers were happy to hand over the goods in exchange for a cash ransom. It was an arrangement that kept both sides happy. Mall lived a colorful life. She is reported to have often performed in men's dress at the Fortune Theater in 1611, where she would banter, sing songs, and play the lute. On a 20-pound bet, she rode from Sharing Cross to Shoreditch, dressed as a man, waving a banner, and blowing a trumpet, all while riding the most famous performing animal in London, a dancing, counting, and dice-playing horse called Morocco. After being burnt on the hands four times as punishment for thievery, Moll became a notorious highwaywoman during the English Civil War at almost sixty years of age. She was eventually caught, tried, and sentenced to death but escaped her fate by paying a 2,000-pound bribe, which would be equivalent today to $419,881. Mary Firth, known as Moll Cutpurse, died on the 26th of July, 1659. According to her will, she asked to be buried, quote, with her breech upwards, that she might be as preposterous in her death as she had been all along in her infamous life, end quote. Next, we have George Barrington. 
George Barrington was an Irish-born pickpocket, popular London socialite, Australian pioneer, and author. His escapades, arrests, and trials were widely chronicled in the London press of his day. Born on the 14th of May, 1755, in County Kildare, Ireland, he was fathered either by a silversmith named Waldron or an English troop commander, Captain Barrington. There is little information about his childhood. We know that he attended school in Dublin until age 16. However, there are conflicting stories as to the specifics of his leaving. One version claims that he stabbed a schoolmate, the other that he robbed his schoolmaster. Both stories agree that George was flogged, ran away, assumed the name Barrington, and joined a traveling theater company. When the company's funds became tight, the manager, quote, prevailed upon Barrington to undertake the profession of a pickpocket. He then commenced in this endeavor by affecting the airs and importance of a man of fashion, end quote. The manager was eventually caught, convicted, and sentenced to transportation to the Australian penal colony. Barrington escaped to London, where he dressed as a priest and continued pickpocketing. The gentleman pickpocket, as Barrington came to be called, had a certain amount of success, but his luck swung like a pendulum. He attempted to rob the Russian Count Orlov of a snuff box worth 30,000 pounds at the Covent Garden Theatre. He was caught and arrested, but later freed when the Count refused to prosecute. Soon after, he was caught picking pockets at the Drury Lane Theatre and was sentenced to three years hard labor. After he served his sentence, he returned to his trade and was caught once more, and sentenced to five years hard labor, but an influential patron arranged his release on the condition that Barrington would leave England. He moved briefly to Dublin, but then returned to London in 1790, where the gentleman pickpocket was once more arrested for pocket picking. This time, he was sentenced to seven years transportation. This is where George Barrington turned his life around. En route to Botany Bay, he helped foil a mutiny, and as a result was issued the first ever warrant of emancipation, and later went on to become the High Constable of Parramatta. Barrington died there in 1804 at the age of 49. The next person on our tour is Chicago May. Chicago May was the nickname of Marianne Dunan, who was born in Edenmore, Ireland in 1871. The self-described Queen of Cooks became notorious in America, in Britain, and in France. At the age of 19, as her mother gave birth to Mary's fourth sibling, Mary stole all of her parents' savings and ran away to New York City by way of Liverpool. In New York, she supported herself through prostitution and pickpocketing before she moved to Nebraska to stay with family. While there, she met and married Dahl Churchill, a member of the Dalton Gang, who was ultimately lynched after an attempted train robbery. Although Mary lost her husband, her marriage had granted her American citizenship. In 1893, she moved to Chicago, where the World's Columbian Exposition was taking place and attracting large crowds. It was during this time that May became the darling of the Chicago newspapers. The Chicago Tribune called her the, quote, queen of the underworld, the world's cleverest woman crook, and a pioneer in women's rights in a world of crooks, end quote. Tribune reporter Genevieve Forbes Herrick credited May with, quote, having perfected the fainting fit, during the agonies of which she would revive sufficiently to steal watches and scarf pins of the men who were helping her, end quote. Another of May's signature tricks, as reported by Herrick, was to lure a man into a handsome cab where she would allow him to, quote, put his arms around her trim waist, her blonde head on his shoulder, end quote, where she would, Quote, bury her lips in his scarf and deftly bite out the scarf pin, end quote. Chicago May was an attractive woman, and she used that to great criminal success. She was described as having bubbling vitality, a baby stare, a dreamy smile, and enchanting, innocent eyes. Even so, by 1928, she had spent a third of her life in prison. Her first prison sentence came as a result of her participation, along with Eddie Guerin, in the 1902 robbery of an American Express office in Paris, they stole the equivalent of $165,000. They were convicted in a French court, and May was sentenced to five years in prison. Guerin was given life on the infamous penal colony Devil's Island. Eventually, and supposedly with May's help, Guerin became one of the few prisoners ever to escape from the island. The two met up in London, but the relationship did not last, and May took up with a burglar named Charlie Smith. During a 1907 altercation between Smith and Guerin, Smith shot the other man, wounding him in the foot. 
Smith and May were tried for attempted murder, and May was convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Upon her release in 1917, she returned to the United States. In a 2005 interview, biographer Nala O'Fallon noted that, quote, May has some absolute core acceptance of herself. She never apologizes for anything. She's perfectly open about what a bad, dreadful woman she was. She's kind of matter-of-fact that life dealt her this hand of cards, and she played it her way, end quote. On May 24, 1929, just 18 months after Herrick's Chicago Tribune feature on Chicago May, May checked herself into a Philadelphia hospital. The Tribune reported that, quote, her complexion was sallow, her tawny hair was thin and streaked, and her bubbling vitality had given away to the slackness of age, end quote. She was there for an abdominal surgery, after which she was planning to marry Charlie Smith. Less than a week later, May died. The Tribune headline read, bluntly, Chicago May, famous woman crook, is dead. Of Chicago May's life, O'Fallon said, quote, This is not a negative story at all. You may have to pay close attention to know that in her terms, her life was a success, her great adventure, end quote. Finally, we come to the man known as the comedy cut purse, the Dapper Dipper, less at The Virtual Museum of History's most famous pickpockets is now closed. Sorry, folks. Looks like that's the end of the tour. Thank you for visiting, and please come again. On the weekend of March 24th, I'll be performing at the Southern Sideshow Hootenanny in New Orleans, Louisiana. Tickets and information are available at southernsideshowhootenanny.com. Then I'll be taking the Cheeky Monkey Sideshow down to the Festival of Legends in Apex, North Carolina. That's on April 13th and 14th. You can get more information at festivaloflegends.com. After that, I'll be at Clown Cabaret in Washington, D.C. on April 17th. You can find out more about that at clowncabaret.com. Speaking of dot-coms, come on over and visit my website, which is lessessmore, L-E-S-S-M-O-O-R-E, dot com. You can also find me on Facebook at Less S More Show. Come on over, give it a like, say hi. I'm always happy to make new friends. Each episode, I teach you a little bit of insider pickpocketing lingo. I realized that in the past episodes, I've used the term mark a few times without explaining it. A mark is the intended target of the pickpocket. An interesting fact about the term mark is that it originated in the carnival sideshows. The ticket seller would have a vantage point standing a little bit higher than the crowd in his ticket box, and that would allow him to see into the wallets of the people coming into the show. That way, he knew if they had a lot of money. He would then gently touch them on the shoulder, leaving a small chalk mark on their back so that the folks inside the tent would know who was the most flush with cash. Pickpocketing has made its way into popular culture, and each episode I like to give a little example of how it's represented in modern media. In 1959, Robert Bresson wrote and directed the movie Pickpocket. Pickpocket is the story of Michel, played by Martin Lassalle, who is a poor, bored, and directionless man living in a rundown flat in Paris. He goes to a horse race and, on a lark, steals money from a spectator's purse. Almost immediately, he is arrested. The police don't have enough evidence against him, so they let Michel go. Later, after watching a group of pickpockets working a crowd, he joins up with them, and they teach him the techniques and skills needed to be a successful cut purse. The movie also features a sickly mother, a well-intentioned friend, a pretty and demure young neighbor, a cunning police inspector, a reference to George Barrington, Michelle's downfall, and his sort of redemption. Pickpocket is another movie that gives nice coverage to the almost choreographed methods and techniques of a pickpocketing gang. It's kind of artful. But what struck me most about Pickpocket was the total lack of facial expression on the face of every single character, not even when they were enraged or weeping. The movie has an overall feeling of oppression, as if, even when life is good, existence, in and of itself, 